Thanks for that, Daniela. It's great to see that we can deploy, relate, and upgrade applications in such a reliable, testable, and automated way. Now, if we only knew what was happening with all of our infrastructure and applications, we'd be set. Thankfully, Seema is coming up next to introduce observability. Take it away, Seema. Thank you, David. So uh, welcome to this session called Observability for Developers of Charmed Operators. My name is Simon Aronson, and I'm the engineering manager of the observability team here at Canonical. I've been a software engineer and open source aficionado for the last uh, 12 or 13 years or something like that. And I've spent most of my career building performant and reliable systems and teams. Every now and then, I also get the opportunity to break things. Sometimes I even do that on purpose, but let's not hope that happens today. So the agenda for this session is, first, we're going to spend some time talking a bit about the importance of observability and why we want our systems to be observable, as well as what observability really is, how it differs from other terms that are being thrown around, uh, and then we're going to go into model-driven observability and how we at Canonical uh, look at observability and approach it as a practice. And last but not least, we are going to have a quite, quite a significant demo of how to work with the Juju Charmed operators and make them observable so that you are able to utilize your common observability practices within Juju as well. And I just want to, uh, before we get started, take a moment to tell you that all the code that we will be using in this session, it will all be available on GitHub in the canonical organization under the Operator Day 2022 Charming Actions repo. So you don't have to try to uh, keep up with me copy pasting things or anything like that. You will be able to get all of it there and use that to, uh, to reproduce what I'm doing. So first off, uh, let's talk a little bit about observability as a concept. We did a poll a while ago on the Ubuntu Twitter page where we asked uh, our followers, what is your take on the observability versus monitoring debate? And as you can see from the screenshot on this slide, most, uh, the most common answer was observe of what? So there seems to be a bit of confusion about, or rather lack of knowledge about what observability really is and how it complements or how it, how it relates to monitoring. So observability is really a buzzword uh, and it aims to describe modern monitoring and telemetry analytics. The term itself is borrowed from the modern control system theory and is a property of a system. It describes a property of a system. So for instance, is my system observable? Can I look at the state of my system and reason about how it's behaving or how it's currently working? Monitoring, on the other hand, is the act of collecting these telemetries, not just metrics, by the way, but all the telemetry that we need uh, to inspect our system. And to be able to fulfill this property of the system, making it observable, that is, we usually have to also monitor it. And the hard truth about operating software is that it's really, really complex and really, really hard. We all want to think of it as this bread toaster that has one lever and maybe one button and we just press it and everything works smoothly, repeatable every time. But in reality, we have these whole teams, whole departments that day in, day out do nothing but monitor that our systems actually behave the way that we intended them to. And as our systems grow more and more complex, especially in this cloud native era of computing, where everything is heavily distributed, containerized, maybe it's even microservices or serverless, it's becoming increasingly hard for operators to get the operational insight they need 
to understand how their systems are working and uh, how they can make them continue to work that way. So at the same time as the complexity increases, the operational insights actually decreases. And given that we have this spread or we have this uh, sort of isolation or extraction into multiple components, there is also a big risk that the issues we see propagate or spread from a system to another. Think, for instance, of a common use case, a very simple one where you would have a database server that in turn is depended on by a backend server, HTTP server, which in turn is utilized by a front end or a web UI that is being consumed by a user. If something were to happen to any of those components, say for instance, to the database component that we would get a deadlock there, then that issue would ripple all the way down to the user and affect the actual user experience. So as operators today, we need a holistic view of dependencies among systems so that we are able to understand how the issues propagate and what impact that will have on the end users. And monitoring is great in that way, in that it has a network effect, as in the more we monitor together and correlate and contextualize, the more operational insights we will get from it. And for all of you that have been uh, working in this field for uh, more than say 10 years, you know this already, but it bears repeating in any case. Monitoring has traditionally been quite toilful. It's a lot of moving parts that you usually manually collect, connect together and then you need to invest, invest significant amount of time into actually keeping them connected as well. And that all that should be monitors, monitor, monitored, and that all that should be monitored stays monitored. So our setup spreads out across many different configurations. We have to keep it together and have to spend time doing that. So the less network effect we're actually going to get out of it because we can't really invest into making our monitoring even better or increasing its coverage, but rather have to spend time retaining what we already have. So if we look at the sort of infrastructure stack of uh, substrates that we might be monitoring, uh, we can see that the lower we get into this stack, the closer we get to bare metal, the less fancy the telemetry becomes. In the bare metal stage, we only have access to usually logs and metrics. And then as we keep climbing the stack upwards towards the end user, we get access to more fancy and more interesting types of telemetry. But this really serves to illustrate that logs and metrics really are the foundation of monitoring, even though there are multiple really, really good uh, alternatives as we start to come closer to the user. And that is also why we in the cost light stack or the cost stack in general has focused on making the experience of running metrics and logs as solid as possible as our first step, because that will be valuable across the whole stack. All right, so the model driven observability that we bring to the table as canonical is the idea that observability through Juju and in particular Juju charmed operators, it should be declarative and low toil. No more of this having to manually make sure that everything stays connected and that it works, that will be automated for you using the Juju model. It should be repeatable and intuitive as well. We are trying, our, we are trying very hard to make sure that the relation interfaces and all the values or all the data that is uh, propagated through these relation interfaces stay clear and uh, uh, is easy to reason about for you as an operator. And last but not least, we want it to be heavily contextualized from the get-go. And, and that brings us to another topic, which is the Juju topology. So when you deploy observability through Juju, together with your other charms, your other workloads that you have in your stack, you out of the box by the libraries provided by us, get access to Juju topology, which, which basically is a concept 
that identifies the single uh, smallest part within your deployment that is represented by Juju. So say, for instance, that you have a Juju model. Within that model, you have multiple applications deployed. Every application has either one or multiple units. And with the Juju topology, you'll be able to take any telemetry that you get from your charm and pinpoint exactly what part of the Juju model uh, these telemetry originated from. So for instance, if you have a deployment of say Mattermost, you'd be able to see that, okay, this Mattermost telemetry that I'm seeing is deployed in this particular Juju model, in this application, in this exact unit, which gives you a lot of context around how things are deployed and how, uh, and how your application works in that, in that particular context. All right, so let's get on to the demo. In this demo, we're going to take the Zinc operator built by uh, Daniela in the previous session, and we're going to add model-driven observability to it. So we're going to add Prometheus monitoring. We're going to add an alert rule. We're going to add Loki logging, as well as the Grafana dashboard, so that when you relate your charm to the call stack, all of that will be taken care of you cared of for you, so you'd be able to just dive into Grafana and have a look at the metrics and logs that are generated by your charm. In this demo, we're going to use a couple of charms that are part of the alert of the cost stack, as well as the sync charm that we created in the prior session. So we're going to use Prometheus for metrics. We're going to use Grafana for dashboards, and we're going to use Loki for logs. And all of these charms are available on Charm Hub, so you can go there and just grab them if you want to try it out yourself. And once again, all code of the session will be available on GitHub, so you don't have to keep up with trying to carbon copy what I put into the source files. All right, so demo time. Let me switch over to my IDE. All right. So in Zinc, we have a couple of different files, namely the file that we want to focus on uh, first in this session is the, the charm source file. So let's go ahead and open that first. All right, there we go. So in the charm source file, uh, we want to first enable the ability for Prometheus uh, metrics to be exported by Zinc itself. This is not enabled by default, so we need to pass an environment variable that explicitly turns the Prometheus endpoint on. So let's go to the Pebble layer that we that we are defining for our Zinc service and add another environment variable to it. And this environment variable we're going to call Zinc Prometheus enable, and we're going to set it to true. We will then create a separate uh, Juju model for us to work in. And we're going to deploy the cost light stack there, just so that we have any, everything we need deployed from the get-go. This is a bundle, which means that it will, pro uh, it will automatically deploy Alert Manager, Grafana, Loki and Prometheus. We'll also wire them together using relations so that we don't have to really do anything for it to work. We just have to focus on our charm. So if we have a look at the Juju status now, we can see that Juju is automatically spinning all of these charms up for us, and it has already created the relation interfaces or the relations between the charms that we need for it to work. So that's great. We also now need to deploy the Zinc charm. So let's go ahead and do that. And as any good TV cook, I've already, pre already prepared builds of this charm so that we don't have to go through the hassle of waiting for that to finish. So instead, we're just going to go ahead and use those pre-built charms, uh, and we're going to go ahead and do the changes 
on screen so that you can see what each of these deployments will contain. So now we're going to go ahead and deploy the first uh, charm, which contains this metrics endpoint enablement. All right. And we can now watch with Juju Watch to make sure that everything is working and that it's getting up all right. So here you can see that we now have a Zinc entry as well and that we are currently installing it, which might take a little while. And once that is done, we're also going to go ahead and try to query the metrics endpoint of that deployment just to make sure that we are actually getting data out of it uh, prior to uh, adding this to the actual charm code, making it automated. So to do that, we need to get the IP of Zinc. And then we need to curl the metrics endpoint of that network interface. So curl HTTP followed by the IP. And the default port for sync is 4080. So we're going to go ahead and use that, followed by metrics. And there we go, the metrics from the sync uh, deployment. And the, we can't really instrument the applications for you. So that you will have to do yourself, unfortunately. But what we can do is to use the metrics that are provided from the underlying application as it is. So in this case with Sync, we have access to some internal metrics about the Go uh, runtime or Go environment, like how the garbage collector is performing, as well as some interesting metrics about Jin, which is the HTML framework used by Sync. So those we are going to use later to make sure that uh, we have something to, to look at. Now let's go ahead and add the ability to use this as a relation as well. For that, we first need to fetch the Prometheus Grape library, which is a library provided by the cost team for you to be able to easily integrate metrics into your charm. So charmcraft fetch lib, and then we fetch the Prometheus Grape library. These are all available on Charm Hub as well, so you can find them there. Uh, and then we see that library Prometheus Scrape version 0 0.18 has been downloaded. Excellent. Now we need to go back to the source file for the Charm and import this library. And in particular, we're going to make use of the metrics endpoint provider in here to actually get our metrics sent over automatically to. Prometheus. We then need to instantiate the provider as part of our init meta method. And we give it a list of jobs, scrape jobs, for it to scrape to get metrics. And in this case, we only have one. But for a different charm, we might have multiple metrics endpoints or even multiple containers to scrape. We would then add those as a list in here so that Prometheus would be able to scrape them all individually. Last but not least, we need to also declare the relation in the uh, metadata file of the charm. Metadata.jaml. So let's add a provide section where we declare metrics endpoint, which uses the interface Prometheus scrape. All right, now let's uh, update our charm with these changes. As you can see here, the endpoint metrics endpoint has now been added to our charm, effectively allowing us to relate this charm to Prometheus over the metrics endpoint relation. So let's do that as well. So the pods that we have had, or the units we had, were restarted as part of this. And uh, if we look at the unit for Prometheus, we can see that we now have a relation to Zinc, which is excellent as well. 
So if we look at Juju status now and grab the Prometheus IP, we should now be able to go to the Prometheus endpoint and have a look at the data. Right, so let's do a simple query. And here we go. Here is our zinc charm. One is a, a Boolean value that means that the zinc charm is up. We can also have a look at the configuration. And here we see that the Juju model that we were talking about earlier, or the Juju topology, is actually present at label as labels on the static config. So any telemetry that, are, that arrive through Prometheus will automatically have these labels attached to it. OK, so back to the code. That works. That's nice. So what we now need to do is to also add an alert rule. We do this by, in the source folder, create a folder called Prometheus Alert Rules, and in it, a file that we'll call unit unavailable. And we deploy the charm and have this specific magic folder available that will be uh, parsed as alert rules and provided over the relation to Prometheus. And I've prepared a simple alert here, alert rule that we can use. Think unit is unavailable. So whenever up is not one, as in the unit is not actually up for 10 seconds or more, then we're going to create an alert with a severity critical, which will result in a notification with this text as a summary and this test, test text as a description. This is really key to how modern observability is supposed to work, I would say, because now we don't have to monitor a dashboard and sit, sitting at, by our desk staring at it, but rather we'll be notified whenever something is happen, happening and can use that information to act immediately. Let's refresh with that alert rule as well. And while we wait for that to come up, let's go ahead and add some logging support. Let's go back to the charm Python file. And first, we want to add a private property that will tell us where the log files should be stored, log file in this case should be stored. We're going to call that log path. Then we want to also mutate or change the command that we use to start sync. So instead of calling sync directly, we want it to T the output that it were to send to SD out into the file that we would define in log path and then send it forward to STD out. So let's go back to Prometheus now. If we go to the alerts page, you can see that we now have a zinc unit is unavailable. That contains the labels that we defined as well as the annotations, or rather the labels that are part of Judo topology, they can't come out automatically. It also contains the severity. And as you can see here in the expression, we've also injected label selectors so that the alert will only fire for anything that relate that originates from the Juju application sync, giving you additional context. So we added the support for actually logging to a file. Let's go ahead and deploy that as well. Once Zinc has restarted, we want to use a command called juju ssh to actually tail this file to make sure that it contains the log entries that we expect it to. And while we wait for that to come up, let's go ahead and implement the charm part of this as well. So. We first want to fetch a charm craft a, charm, a lib from Charm Hub called Loki Push API, which appears as well in the lib folder that we have in our project. We then want to import it just as we did with the metrics endpoint provider. And we then want to also instantiate the log proxy consumer that we imported in our init function. 
here we point out what files we want our log proxy consumer to uh, to actually forward to Loki. And in this case, we only have one file, the sync logs. But in a more complex charm, you might have separate files for audit logs or for uh, logs related to storage or for networking logs or something like that. Then you would just add all of them as a list here to the log files property or key. And last but not least, we also want to add a relation for this in the metadata. So we add a required section. We call the relation logging, and it implements the interface Loki push API. Now, before we upload this and try this out as well, let's go back and check whether we are able to tail the log file that we expect our data to be written to. Awesome. So these are the these are the debug logs of Gen, and as you can see, it declares what endpoints we have and what they point at in terms of handlers. So that's good. Now let's also refresh Zinc with the lock proxy that we implemented. Just as before, we can see that we now have another new endpoint called log logging, which means that we will also be able to relate Loki to Zinc. And now just to make sure this is somewhat interesting to look at when we come to the Grafana part, I'm going to go ahead and start a, a simple load generator against Zinc just to make sure we actually get some requests to look at. I'll do that off screen. No need to see that, but it's a simple curl command. Stop that. All right, so let's have a look at the video status again. All our units are active, all our applications are active, and in the relation section, we can see that we now have a Zinc to Prometheus relation, we have a Loki to Zinc relation, and we also need a Grafana to Zinc relation, which we haven't yet implemented. Before we do that, let's go into Grafana and have a look at what we currently have. So we're going to use a Juju action called get admin password to get the initial password of the Juju of the Grafana instance so that we can log into the admin account on it. We then also need the IP of Grafana. Let's go ahead and grab that as well and then go to our browser. Grafana will be available on port 3000, and the username will be admin, and the password we just fetched through the action will paste in the password box. Now we're in Grafana. Awesome. Let's do a few exploratory queries just to make sure our data is actually there. So first, Loki, and then we use the Juju unit just to select something. And these are the same sort of logs that we could see earlier when we tailed the log file. So that seems to work. And it also has the Juju topology strapped onto it. Awesome. Let's do the same for Prometheus. And we are then going to use the up metric. And this seems to reflect the Juju, uh, the charm upgrades that we did. So this seems to be correct as well. Great. Now back to the code for the last part, which is adding the Grafana dashboard. We then need to fetch the Grafana dashboard library from Charmcraft. We then import it just as we did with the other ones. In this case, it's called Grafana dashboard provider as we are providing dashboards to Grafana. And then in the init method, or init function, we will add an instantiation of Grafana dashboard provider as well. Last, we add it to the metadata file, just as we did with the prior ones. And this was a provider, so we added under provides. And then we also need to add a dashboard. And 
creating dashboards is actually quite a craft and it can take quite a lot of time. So for the sake of this demo, I've prepared a dashboard that we're just going to paste in, but you could do your graph, your dashboards yourself and just put them in there as JSON and it would be able to, to pick it up and, and forward it to Grafana. So we create a folder called Grafana Dashboards. In it, we create a file called zinc.json.tmpl as in template. And then I'll just copy the JSON I've already prepared. And then we will refresh once again with the new charm, which will give us a new endpoint again, Grafana dashboards. And then we relate Grafana to Zinc. And then we wait for a while for Zinc to restart and propagate these changes to all of the related charms. So what, we, what have we done so far? We have added support for a Loki dashboard, or sorry, for a Grafana dashboard to be propagated through the uh, relation data. We've added support for Loki logging and Prometheus alert rules, as well as metrics. So let's have a look at Jojo Watch to see how we're doing. And as you can see, Grafana is executing and it's just done. And now we go back to the Grafana UI. We go to dashboards and manage. And we can see that we have our Zinc dashboard here. So if we open that, we have all of these selectors at the top that allows us to pinpoint exactly what Loki version we want this to uh, what Loki data source we want this to run in, what Prometheus data source we want this to run in, what Juju unit we want it to apply to, the Juju application as well, as the Juju model UUID and the Juju model. So, so far, so good. Everything is excellent. Now, as you can see, uh, we can see our, uh, our Juju unit being up for the sync uh, deployment. Let's see what happened to our load generation. So as you can see here, <laughs> it's querying uh, for all its heart's desire. And once uh, Prometheus starts to scrape that as well, we will get some pretty graphs in here as well. And let's have a look at one of the queries while we wait. So in this case, we are getting the HTTP request rate. So we are summing the rate of gene requests for this particular set of labels, that is our Zinc application, and we are grouping them by Juju unit and showing them as a rate for the last two minutes. And in that way, we will get a graph that will show us, okay, so here are the, the, um, the amount of requests over at each point in time rounded by its two minute average. And here, we can't really see it yet because it's still coming in, but we are starting to get our data here. There you go. So here we have the request rate, 396 per minute, as it looks. And here we have the duration of each HTTP request, or rather the percentiles of HTTP requests. So we can see that for the 99th percentile, the time it took was 4.95 milliseconds. For the 95th percentile, it was 475. For the median, i.e. percentile 50, it was 2.5 ms. And for the first percentile, it was 50 nanoseconds, I think, or microseconds. So 
That is excellent. We now have everything we need to be able to monitor this at a basic level. We also have our logs at the bottom, so we'll be able to see and contextualize whether, a, for instance, a spike in HTTP requests or a spike in duration means that we also get some error logs into our application logs. Right, so that was actually it for the presentation. Uh, just to recap, we started from the simple, fully functional charmed operator for sync that was provided to us by Daniela Placencia. All the code for that is available as well on GitHub. We added Prometheus monitoring to it. We added built-in alert rules. We added Loki logging as well as a Grafana dashboard. And all of that within 45 minutes. And that was it. So thank you so much for attending. And if you have any questions, feel free to write them in the chat. And back to you, David.